Hey there, and welcome back to the channel. This is another video about collustructional analysis, but in this video I want to focus on a method that is called distinctive colexeme analysis. Now, distinctive colexeme analysis, what's that? It is an extension of collustructional analysis that is used for the analysis of pairs of constructions. When you have two constructions, you can compare them in terms of their respective collocational preferences. So, if you have two constructions that do similar jobs, that perform similar functions, they might still differ a lot with regard to the words that occur inside them. And that is what distinctive colexeme analysis is for. Um, in the second part of this video, I will show you how to run a distinctive colexeme analysis with a concordance program such as ANCONC and a spreadsheet software such as Excel. All the materials that you need you can download from links in the description below. So everything you need is actually there and you can follow along with the steps that I present in this video. So with no further ado, let's go. Distinctive colexeme analysis, what is it? Um, let's go back to this contingency table that I showed in the last video on collustructional analysis. Um, here we cross tabulate different frequencies. <clears throat> so, um, the four fields that you've seen before and that you are very familiar with by now are, uh, first of all, the red one. How do, often do we find a word, a collocate of a construction, such as C in the be going to construction or find in the split infinitive or anything like that? Yeah, so how often do we find the word in the construction? How often do we find the word not only in the construction but in the corpus as a whole? That's the green field. Uh, how often do we find the construction in the corpus? Yeah, so the be going to construction or the split infinitive construction or whatever other construction you might be looking at. And then lastly, uh, the famous fourth cell. Yeah, how many constructions are there in the corpus? Okay, so that is collustructional analysis the way I presented it in the last video. Um, with Going to and the verb C, uh, we would uh, check how often we find going to C. We check how often we find C in the corpus as a whole. We check we, how often we find be going to in the corpus and how many constructions we have. In this case, how many infinitive verbal constructions we have. Right. Um, now, this, no. <clears throat> this is the logic of collustructional analysis as I explained it last time. You check the uh, collocate frequencies of a construction and you compare those collocate frequencies against the frequencies of the same words in the corpus as a whole. Okay, so you check the construction occurs with x three times and um, in the corpus as a whole we find x uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10 times, and that's what we take as the basis for comparison. Right, now that type of collustructional analysis actually has a name that I didn't use last time. Uh, if it's contrasted with other types of collustructional analysis, this is what you would call a colexeme analysis. Yeah? Technical term, you can use it. Um, it's the basic type of collustructional analysis, goes by colexeme analysis. Now, distinctive colexeme analysis, what we're going to talk about today in this video, is a little different. Yeah? For a distinctive colexeme analysis, you need to have a pair of constructions that fulfill similar functions, like for instance the be going to construction and the modal auxiliary will. Okay, Both express future time, so uh, their meaning, if you like, is similar but they still differ with regard to the words that typically occur in them. Yeah? So be going to has different collocational preferences than will. The same is true for the ditransitive construction and the prepositional dative construction. Yeah? The ditransitive, John gave Mary a book. Prepositional dative, John gave a book to Mary. Yeah? Both occur with give and send and promise. Uh, but there are asymmetries. There are some verbs that really prefer the ditransitive and some verbs that really prefer the prepositional dative. Um, we can also go for something like the present perfect versus the simple past. 
I saw versus I have seen. You can, any, you can use any verb in either of these, but uh, when you count how often you find a given range of verbs, there are asymmetries, there are differences between these constructions, and distinctive colleague-seam analysis allows you to uncover these asymmetries. So, what all of these constructions have in common is that they involve a slot for a lexical element. So, the be going to construction has a slot for a lexical verb. Be going to meet, see, find. Yeah, that is what I'm talking about when I use the term slot. Uh, also, the English modal auxiliary will. It has a slot for a verb in the infinitive. I will see, I will do, I will go, I will meet. Yeah, um, That's what's meant by that. And the question that distinctive colleague seam analysis allows you to address is whether there are lexical elements that occur preferentially with one construction rather than the other. Okay, They might very well occur with both, and they might even occur frequently with both. But given how frequent the one construction is and the other, uh, the verbs might not be evenly distributed across the two. So we're looking for verbs that are maximally uneven in their distribution across the two constructions. Let me show how that uh, can be visualized. So here we have a corpus again, and we retrieve from that corpus all the examples of construction A, and we count the lexical elements that co-occur with that construction. Okay, so let's say construction A occurs uh, seven times, three times with Y, three times with Z, and once with X. And uh, that could be the basis for a constructional analysis. But um, we don't want to compare this to the entire corpus. We want to compare these frequencies to the frequencies in construction B. Uh, construction B also occurs with Y. It also occurs with X and with Z. But the frequencies are different. Yeah? So construction A has an overrepresentation of Z and an underrepresentation of X when we compare it to construction B. That, in a nutshell, is the logic of distinctive colleague seam analysis. Right. So with that in mind, let's go back to the contingency table and see what frequencies we are looking for here. So we are. Um, looking for a word that appears in construction A and also in construction B. Okay, so the red cell would be how often do we find the word in construction A, the green cell would be how often do we find the word in construction B, and of course we can add up the two yeah, to get a marginal frequency of how often we find either construction A or construction B with that word in the corpus. Yeah. Then um, we have the uh, total frequency of construction A and the total frequency of construction B, which again we can add up. And from those frequencies, we can then compute a measure of association between the word and the construction, much in the way of what we've done with uh, collocations. Yeah, collocation measures such as mutual information or the t-score or the z-score uh, and what we've done with log likelihood with uh, colleague-seam analysis in the last video. All right, so um, just to make this more explicit, here uh, I've exemplified this logic with the be going to construction and the will construction with the same verb c. Okay, so we would look for the frequencies of going to C, uh, which would be the red cell, will C, that would be the green cell, the uh, complete uh, total frequency of be going to in the corpus would be the blue cell, and the complete frequency of will uh, combined with any verb in the infinitive would be the purple cell. Yeah, Not so complicated. You recognize bits and pieces that I've talked about in earlier videos. Uh, if you haven't seen them, you know, check them out. <clears throat> but basically, that is what we're analyzing in the distinctive colleague seam analysis. Right, so let's get to business. Let's run a distinctive colleague seam analysis. Um, how do you do it? There are five steps. Um, first of all, we need to extract all the examples of construction A 
from a corpus. So we need to run a concordance using a program such as AntConc, and we need to identify the frequencies of all lexical collocates. Uh, if you remember the last video on color structural analysis, you're actually familiar with this. You should be able to do this on your own. Uh, but we'll go through this uh, with another example here. Then we need to do the exact same thing in step two for construction B. So again, we have to run a concordance. We have to identify the frequencies of all lexical collocates. And then we get to steps three, four, and five. Step three would be that we have to align the frequencies of all lexical collocates. So in a way, we have to merge two frequency lists. If you've never done this before, well, you might think, yeah, what can go wrong? A lot of things can go wrong. Uh, so we'll talk about this. And uh, step four then is something that will ring familiar to you. We have to apply a statistical test that tells us which lexical elements are most surprisingly uneven in their distribution across construction A and construction B. And then finally, once we've done that, we can just look at the elements that are most distinctive for construction A and for construction B, and we can inspect those elements qualitatively and find out more about construction A and construction B in terms of what they are actually doing, what they accomplish functionally. All right, so let's go. Um, let's take an example. Uh, the example that we're taking for this video is an adjectival construction, a pair of adjectival constructions, if you like. Um, namely, adjectives that are used attributively and adjectives that are used predicatively. Let me explain what these constructions are. So the English attributive adjective construction would uh, have the adjective in front of the noun. So combining with a determiner and a noun such that the determiner comes first, then the adjective, and then the noun. In phrases such as the red guitar, <coughs> or the spicy food, which I cannot show you any longer, sorry. Um, so uh, that's adjective usage uh, attributively. And then there's the predicative adjective construction, where the adjective actually follows a form of the verb to be. So uh, again, we can have a sequence of a determiner, a noun, a form of the verb to be, and an adjective, the guitar is red or the food is spicy, basically conveying the same kind of meaning as the red guitar and the spicy food. And no surprise, many adjectives, you can have them in either of the two constructions, but there are some rogue adjectives that really just happen in one of the two, okay? Think of an adjective such as only. You know? This is our only chance. You can say this is our only chance, but not our chance is only. <clears throat> um, occasional is another example. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I go on an occasional holiday. So ah, that's a terrible example. But I mean. Google occasional, uh, you will find some examples that work attributively, but not predicatively. Right, um, so that's our material. And um, step one should be that we extract all examples of construction A from a corpus. So um, if you're my student, this is the time to fire up the old ANCONC and um, load in the files from the British National Corpus A, okay? So in the top menu, go to Open Directory, navigate to the BNCA files, and then pick those files. If you're not my student and you want to follow, then, well, you can pick a corpus of your own choice and uh, just, just follow along uh, with different data, or you can download the data that I, uh, that you can access with the links from the description. So uh, this is what ANCONC should look like once you've loaded the A files into it. Um, again, we need to perform a little uh, adjustment in the settings in the tool preferences. Namely, I want you to check this box, put delimiter around hits in the keyword in context display. 
right? Hit apply so that Ancon remembers and uh, we're on our way. So um, <laughs> if you want to, you can actually try uh, this on your own if you like, yeah? So try to search for attributive adjectives where you have a determiner, the adjective, and then a noun. Okay, there's a regex here that you can use. You don't need to look at it, or you can just squint. Yeah, uh, but here's one that works. Okay, so you feel free to take it. Feel free to uh, just uh, look at this and, and and type it into the search window of AntConc. So we're looking for the with its determiner tag, then an adjective that consists of lowercase letters, several of them, white space, and then a singular noun, a singular count noun. And again, it should only consist of lowercase letters. That means we're losing some words with hyphens and, and other nouns that we could potentially include. But for the purposes of this exercise, let's not worry too much about that. So. This regular expression, yeah, so you need to activate the regex checkbox and you see that my sorting uh, parameters here are one right, second right, third right, and I set the search window size to 150. It doesn't really matter how you handle this as long as all of the search expression is on your screen once you get your results. Okay, so um, yeah, uh, when I did this, the first example that came up was the troubled kitchen, the monthly average, the new company, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I hope it looks the same for you. If not, results that you can download in the description below. Okay, um, there's one thing that you see here, namely that uh, this regex gives us more than 25,000 examples, so a lot. Yeah, we're, we're dealing with substantial amounts of data here. It's a 12 million word corpus, so yeah, more than 25,000 hits for this um, attributive adjective construction. Um, well, that gives us something to work with. Um, save the output. Okay, so under File, Save Output, select the name for the results that you can remember, like attributive.txt save it on your desktop or anywhere where you can find it. And when you open the text file, it should look something like this here. Um, now what you can see here is that there are tabs before and after the search expression. That's important when you copy and paste it into Excel, which would be the next step, okay? So if yours doesn't look like this, maybe double check if you have uh, set the settings to delimit the search term uh, in the in the tool settings okay right moving on copy and paste this into excel now in the materials that go with this video there's an excel file that has this so you can actually look at this and compare your own version to uh, the, the the file that's already there hopefully yours looks a little something like this I made this a little nice and tidy with headers, yeah, so the number of the example, left context, search term, right context with a bit of aligning so that this is, um, what is it, right bound and this is left bound and this is centered so um, that it is pleasing to the eye when you look at your corpus data, yeah. Nothing is quite as pleasing to the eye as a nice set of corpus data. Right, here we go. Um, let's take the middle column here, the one with the search term, and copy and paste it into a new sheet. Why do we do that? Well, we want to have just the adjectives, okay? Not the determiner, not the noun, because we want to make a frequency list of only the adjectives. And in the last video, if you remember, uh, we already did that for the infinitives in the split infinitive construction. So we're going to do exactly that just with this data here. So what we need to do is get rid of the determiner, get rid of the noun, 
and you maybe still know how to do that. Now, if you do, pause the video, try it, you know, give it a try, and see uh, if you can get Excel to delete all the stuff that you don't need. Okay, I'm going to continue now. So here are the um, uh, <coughs> characters that you need to type in in order to do a search and replace. So basically deleting is a search and replace where you replace something with nothing in Excel. I know, I know, you experts who are doing this with, I don't know, text editors and um, there are more elegant ways of doing this. Yeah, <clears throat> You can bask in that glory of, of knowing that. Um, but hey, this is a beginner's video. Yeah. Here we go. So, um, if you want to get rid of the determiner, you need to type in the tag and then the and then a white space. That's important, okay? Type in the white space, otherwise you'll be left with um, adjectives that have invisible white spaces to the left and right, and that's not good. Um, okay, once you've done that, <clears throat> you also need to search for the uh, noun tag. Uh, this time with a white space in front of it, actually. Um, and then a little wildcard expression that captures the noun that sits to the right of the noun tag. Okay? Right. Now, if you do these, bo uh, these uh, two search and replace with nothing operations, you should be left with a column that has only the adjectives in them. Yeah? looking like this, troubled, monthly, new, and so on and so forth. And that you can easily convert into a frequency table using the um, tableau croisé dynamique, uh, pivot table, whatever you like to call it. Yeah. So in French Excel, French Excel is the plus sophistiqué. Um, it's my favorite. No kidding. Um, so Synthesize this with a crossed table and you get a frequency table like this, okay? So you drag the search term into the lines and into the values and this is what should magically appear in your Excel. Okay, starts with abandoned, abdominal, abiding and so on and so forth. So it's already alphabetically ordered, which is nice. And this then you can copy and paste uh, to yet another sheet in your Excel file so that you have the adjectives and their frequencies in the attributive construction. Okay, if you've accomplished this, congratulations, that's actually uh, already a major step in what we're trying to do here. Um, now obviously we need to do the same stuff for the predicative adjectives, okay? So let's go through that uh, quickly because right now what we have is all the information that we need for the red cell, okay? How often do we find the word in construction A? We find abandoned three times, abdominal once, abiding once, above 23 times. Okay, so we have this cell we still need to look out for the information that we need for the other three. So, um, let's declare victory on step one, and let's move on to step two, extracting all examples of construction B. And if you like, um, you can think for yourself, okay, how do I search for um, the noun, some form of to be adjective, okay? This could be, um, noun was adjective or nouns were adjective or I am adjective. Yeah, so you have to write a little expression that captures all of that. <clears throat> if you want to think about it, do it now or you can just go with the flow and uh, type in this expression here. So what I did here was I got rid of the determiner questionable choice, but hey, it's what I did. Um, so we start with the noun, and uh, then a form of the verb to be. You know that be as a verb has its own tag, 
in the BNC. So it's a word, white space, V for verb, B for B. Who would have known? And then a question mark because uh, we can have VBZ is, VBD was, VBB are, and is that all we have here? Well, there are a couple more, yeah, but you see that we capture this kind of variety with uh, this tag. Um, a to Z in angular brackets with a plus means we catch all the words that consist of lowercase letters, meaning that we're probably missing out on contracted forms like z, er, yeah, he's, we're, and so on and so forth. If you wanted to include those, well, modify this a little bit and uh, see if you catch anything. The corpus that we're working with here it's a written corpus, so I doubt that there will be too many contractions, but hey, it's an empirical science, so be prepared to find things that you didn't expect. And then, of course, there's the adjective, the one that we're after. Uh, so this gives me examples like ability is likely to, abortion was unethical, abortion is wrong, uh, abuse are malicious, so... Okay, 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 so the noun is actually not, well, it's part of a phrase that is plural and so on and so forth. Um, clearly, this is a quick and dirty solution for an exercise that we're doing here. Um, well, if you're doing this in a serious kind of study, uh, you need to think long and hard about the examples that you want to include and the ones that you want to exclude and how you formulate your searches. But for what we're doing here, this is okay. Again, save the output, predicative txt, um, and your file should look something like this. Uh, again, if it doesn't, there's a file that you can download uh, that looks exactly like this. And again, there are the tabs before and after the search term, so you can easily copy and paste this into Excel. Um, again, eliminate the noun and the verb so that you are left with only the adjective. Um, pause this video here to check what, what I wrote here. So this is the noun tag and uh, all of the letters of the noun, the verb tag and all of the letters of the verb. And this leaves you with only the adjectives, which then you can, using a, a cross table, pivot table, however you want to call it, uh, to convert all of that into a frequency list. And here you see, wow, able, 57 examples. Yeah, predicative. Someone is able. John is able to convince the greatest skeptics. Um, try to do that with an attributive construction. The able debater, I have no idea. Yeah, so able. My strong prediction is that this will come up as the significant distinctive colexeme of the predicative construction. Okay, you know the next step. We have to copy and paste this into the sheet where we already have the frequencies of the attributive construction. And that would mean that we now have all the information for the red cell and all the information for the green cell as well. So we're basically 50% done here, which is great news. Um, yeah, so here we have all the adjectives and their frequencies in the attributive construction. Here we have all the adjectives and the frequencies in the predicative construction. Right, um, that means we're officially done with step two. Congratulations if you uh, have accomplished this. And this means that we're getting to the thorny step three, aligning the frequencies. Okay, <clears throat> so for, for those of you who don't identify as complete nerds, this is going to hurt a little, okay? Uh, this is going to be a little bit boring and a little bit like a total headache. Let me explain the problem. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, we have the adjective able, which exists in both constructions. Okay, 
once we have it with the attributive construction, 57 times with the predicative construction. Uh, abnormal, okay, we have it too. <clears throat> Above, we have that in both constructions. But then we have things like abandoned and abdominal, which don't seem to occur in the predicative construction. Yeah. Um, actually, if you scroll down, so for the attributive construction, we have about 3,000 types. And for the predicative construction, we have only about 1,000. So 2,000 adjectives in this column don't even exist in this one. Yeah. So you might say, well, no problem. Um, we'll just, you know, read through this list and uh, check if we find the adjective here. And if we don't, then we delete all the rest. You know how long that takes? I mean, we're in quarantine and everything, but trust me, you don't want to spend that kind of time. Um, so we, we need to find some kind of principled way of automatizing this, of throwing away the nouns, the, the adjectives that we don't want, or better yet, uh, get a cross table where we find out, okay, which ones exist in this list, but not in the other and vice versa. Yeah, because there might be adjectives that are in this list that are not present in this one. Yeah, even though this one has more, it could be that, and in fact, it is the case that the predicative construction occurs with adjectives that are not attested in the attributive construction. So, how do we do this? Um, well, Excel wouldn't be Excel if it didn't have a function for this. So, this is nothing that you can just figure out by, you know, applying logic or thinking about this long and hard. Uh, it's just that, hey, there's a function for it that Excel knows that you can apply that gives you the answer. And, um, well, in my trusty French Excel, this uh, function is called Recherche V. Recherche V is uh, Recherche Vertical. There's also Recherche Horizontal, but that is, um, no, I, let's not go there. Um, so, Recherche V takes uh, three, no, four arguments. It uh, takes an argument that is the search term. So we're looking for this element here, A2, in this list. Okay, so basically what we're asking it to tell us is that, okay, do we find this in this list? Um, so the list is specified in a way that is peculiar to Excel. So uh, cell E1 to cell E1031, so basically all the thousand types that we have, that is the list that we're working with. Uh, they're separated by semicolons. Uh, one that, um, well, we're dealing with one colon here, with one column. Um, there are tables where you may have multiple columns. Uh, so this, this basically, uh, gives you the value that you want to appear in the cell where you have the formula. Okay, basically don't worry about it. Um, and then the last one uh, is an argument that we set to faux or to false. If you have the English, the old English uh, Excel, in English this function is called VLOOKUP. Okay, not quite as fancy as Recherche, but hey, VLOOKUP, uh, the syntax is the same, A2 and the list of elements here, 1 and false. If you're using Italian Excel, don't ask me, yeah, German Excel, I don't know if that even exists. If you do this, there is a result that appears here that says NA, meaning that abandoned I don't find in this list, okay? Now, that's a start, obviously. Uh, if you click on the bottom right, right corner of this cell and you drag it down or you just double click it, it will automatically fill out all the remaining cells in uh, this column here. And uh, you will get, magically, all the adjectives that uh, appear in this column and that also appear in this column. 
Okay, so able, abnormal, above, abrupt, absent, absolute, absurd, abysmal, and so on and so forth. That's not bad, huh? That's that's kind of cool. So every time I do this, I'm kind of impressed, even though, um, well, again, the people who are using other programming environments, they would tell us that, yeah, well, okay, it's fine, but there are more elegant ways of doing it, which is, of course, true. But this is good for us. Yeah, we can do this. Right, uh, so moving on, we need to do the same kind of thing for uh, abnormal that we find here that we're looking for in these adjectives. So, <clears throat> oh wait, wait, there's, there's one more thing that I need to explain. And that would be that uh, once we have this column, we need to copy and paste it into a different place, preferably just the column next to it. And uh, we copy and paste it in such a way that we use copy and paste special, collage special, and we tell Excel to only copy and paste the values, the valeur. Because when you have underlying formulas in the cells and you do things to the table, these formulas will be recomputed, the results will change, and it will all be a big mess. So, to be safe, copy and paste it, uh, retaining only the values, so that uh, your table momentarily looks kind of ugly, okay? But once you have this, you can actually delete the old column with uh, the um, formulas, or you can copy and paste everything to a new sheet where you then uh, clean it up and delete all the stuff that isn't necessary, but you still have the original. All of this is possible, yeah? I'm just saying that do yourself a favor and don't work with uh, the column where you still have the underlying formula that may change at any given moment. Right. Um, so now for the second part, where we need to check whether able is part of the adjectives that we find in the attributive construction. Um, okay, so we go into uh, this field here and we write uh, recherche V and then E2, that is the um, cell where we have able in the attributive construction. And then we formulate this list here by saying, okay, everything from A1 to, oh my God, this is wrong, this is wrong, this should be an A, not an E. Um, so from A1 to A3541, which is the number of different adjective types that we have in the attributive construction. I told you, if you're not a nerd, this is terrible stuff, yeah? So uh, bear with me, we're almost there, we're really almost there. Um, so once we have Abel popping up in the cell, that's already very good news. It means that Abel, uh, which is present in the predicate of construction, is also present in the uh, attributive construction. So that's a match. Again, you double click this little uh, square back here um, and you end up with a full list of overlapping adjectives. Right. So you might look at this and say, well, it doesn't look like we're almost there. It looks like a complete mess, um, which is sort of true, but not quite, okay? So before we do anything else, let's put my advice into practice and copy and paste this with the uh, valeur, yeah? So we have this, uh, and our sheet looks like this now with um, the columns side by side, and they look identical, but one has the formulas underneath it, and one has only the values. Okay, so um, once we have that, copy and paste everything into a new sheet where you can delete stuff without losing any information. What we want to do now is we want to do some sorting. Okay, we have three columns with all our information about the attributive construction, <clears throat> the adjectives, the frequencies, and the information whether or not the adjective also occurs in the predicative construction. <clears throat> so 
So we want to sort these after the third column here, whether or not the pred and the adjective is also present in the other construction. Um, and that um, we accomplish by using this uh, function of um, sorting. Okay, so under data there is um, a sorting function, trier, yeah, and you can choose the column after which you'd like to sort. <clears throat> Never in my life did I think that I would be coaching people <laughs> through Excel, uh, but here we are, yeah. So uh, you sort after this column, and what should appear on your screen is something that you can sort of see hidden here. Um, so all of these adjectives that appear are now uh, listed alphabetically in the first three columns. We do the same for the three columns that have all the information on the predicative construction. And then we have something that looks a lot neater than everything that we had before. Okay, If you look closely, you see that the adjectives are actually perfectly aligned. Okay, We have two identical lists of adjectives, starting with able, academic, affectionate, ambiguous, ambitious, angry, anxious, appropriate, and they all line up, okay? Which is nice, because now also the frequencies line up completely, okay? The frequency of able in the attributive construction, able in the predicative construction, uh, abnormal in uh, attributive and predicative, and so on and so forth. That's great, no? That's, that's cool. Um, so, <clears throat> we also, if we scroll further down, actually see the adjectives that are present in the attributive construction and not in the predicative construction. Yeah? So abandoned three times in the attributive, but not present in the predicative. So here you could technically say that, okay, we have these frequencies for the attributive construction and a zero for the predicative. And of course, we also have the reverse. We have adjectives that appear in the predicative construction, like abundant and accorded and adjudged, afraid. You can say the child is afraid, but not the afraid child. Um, so this would mean that there is actually a zero in the attributive construction and a three in the predicative construction. For our purposes, I'm going to ignore all of these non-overlapping adjectives, okay? In other distinctive colexium analyses, well, you might want to include them because there might be adjectives that are quite frequent, yeah? Actual, what the actual, that's a frequent usage in the uh, attributive construction, but the <laughs> is actual, no. Yeah, that doesn't work. So that would be an interesting asymmetry to look for. Okay, um, so for our purposes, we're just going to copy and paste the overlapping adjectives so that we have a frequency table that looks something like this. Okay, the adjectives in alphabetical order, their frequencies in the attributive construction, their frequencies in the predicative construction, and that gives us the basis for our distinctive colexeme analysis. We're really almost there, and it's time to just do one more thing, namely sorting after the attributive construction or the uh, predicative construction. So if I sort after the attributive construction, only new, old, and great uh, come out as the most frequent ones. If I sort after predicative, we have likely, available, full, able, and so on and so forth. Right. <clears throat> With that, we've accomplished step three, which I said was a bit of a headache, uh, but we made it through it, so that's good. Now, all that's left to do is that we apply a statistical test that tells us which elements are uneven in their distribution, and we're going to use log likelihood for that one more time. Um, so how do we do it? How do we compute distinctiveness? Um, so we have 
the first two cells in the table. Yeah? So this is where uh, the frequencies for the attributive construction, that's the word in construction A, frequencies in the predicative construction, that would be the word in construction B. Um, we still need the blue and the purple cell, the frequency of construction A, if you remember, about 25,000, that is our blue cell, and our purple cell, uh, that is the uh, frequency of construction B, the predicative, which is not as frequent, just uh, 3,500. So we'll enter these as cells into the table so that we have all four cells present in each row. Yeah, you see that. <clears throat> so how often do we find uh, free in construction A? 45 times. How often do we find it in construction B? 26 times. How often do we find construction A? 25,242. How often do we find construction B? 3,541. All there. Yeah. And from these numbers, our um, Excel or whatever technique we want to use can uh, compute all the remaining figures in the contingency table. One thing that we uh, can do as a first step is to compute expected frequencies in construction A and construction B. Um, if you're not sure how to do this, go back to one of the earlier videos, yeah? or you can download the Excel file that has all this, and you can take a peek at the underlying formula in these cells here. <clears throat> um, so here we see, for example, that likely, yeah, 25 times in the attributive construction, more than 200 times in the predicative construction, the expected frequencies are pretty much the mirror image of that. Okay, We expect more than 200 examples of likely in the attributive construction and only 30 in uh, the predicative construction. So this is very, very asymmetric in its distribution. Okay, and then uh, that brings us to the last step. So I've talked about log likelihood before. Here we apply it one more time. And um, no surprises. Yeah? So this very uh, striking distribution of likely across the two constructions gives us an incredibly high log likelihood value. Okay, So it is really, really uneven in its distribution. It's not what we would expect. Um, I included here another column that says uh, distinctiveness, whether the construction, whether the word is attracted to construction A or construction B. That is something that uh, I determine on the basis of the observed and expected frequencies. So if uh, the expected frequency in construction A is a lot higher than the actually observed frequency, then we say that, well, um, the, con the, the word is obviously attracted to construction B. Um, and uh, let's see, here we have one that goes the other way. It will be small, okay? Small occurs 175 times in the attributive construction. We expect it 165 times. <clears throat> so that means that it occurs more often than we would expect, even though not terribly a lot more often, yeah? So the log likelihood value isn't all that large. Okay. So what can we do with this? Um, first of all, let's declare victory on step four. We have applied a statistical test, and we now have data that we can analyze. Um, but what can we see? So one thing that I want you to do is uh, sort after log likelihood. You can uh, do that with the sorting tool that we talked about earlier, data, sort, pick the log likelihood column, and uh, from largest to smallest value. And you see that the order has changed a little bit. Yeah. So um, look different here. So here everything is more or less mixed up. Uh, here it's nice and tidy. And now we can apply a thing that I haven't talked about before, but that is also very useful in Excel and filters. So under data, there is an option that says automatic filters. Activate that, 
and uh, there are <clears throat> little triangles that appear next to all the column labels and you can click on that and select for example um, attraction to construction A when you click on the little triangle next to distinctiveness. Um, that gives you all the adjectives that have a high log likelihood value um, that are attracted to construction A. So all the adjectives that are typical for the um, attributive construction. And we see the top collocates, the top distinctive collocates are new, only, old, final, original, social, great, and so on and so forth. Now all of them are of course relatively frequent, yeah? but you see that the frequency <clears throat> Uh, does not agree 100% with the log likelihood value. Yeah? So we have, for example, 267 instances of great, which is judged to be less distinctive than, for example, social, which has only 163 elements. Yeah? So frequency and the association measure of, of log likelihood, they don't line up 100%, and we trust the log likelihood more so than the raw frequencies. Okay, so let's look at some of these adjectives. Um, take for example old, okay? Old is one of the top distinctive colleagues of the attributive construction and here we see some observations that, well, we are familiar with but nonetheless that are telling in a way. So for example, an old friend is not a friend who is old, okay? Um, or an original recipe is not a recipe that's quite original. Okay, that those two uh, utterances mean different things. An original recipe means that, yeah, I've got it from my Italian grandma, and that's quite original, means that, yeah, there's a reason that no one thought of that before. Uh, it simply doesn't, you know, don't, don't you don't have to do that again. Um, social psychology, that's a field. Yeah? The psychology of social is just a weird sentence to say. Yeah. So, um, the only way, that is something that we frequently say, the way is only is word soup. That's something that you cannot even say. Um, so, what we can take away here is that there are adjectives that are strongly associated with one of the two constructions, and in this one construction, it has a special conventionalized meaning. Okay? So, of course, there is the red guitar, the guitar is red, and so on and so forth, the spicy food, the food is spicy, where the meanings of the adjectives are completely identical and compositional. Here, we have something more going on, and that is what distinctive colloxeme analysis can bring out. Um, another quick look at the uh, predicative adjectives. Here, if you sort after predicative, those are the ones that you get at the top, so able, for example. Um, we can find examples like the student is able to run a distinctive colloquium analysis, but you cannot say the able student. Well, you can, but again, it's a very kind of different animal. Yeah, um, I'm available. I can say that. Yeah, to my students. Yeah, you can write me an email. I'm available, but I cannot be uh, called the available professor. That, that doesn't work. So again, we have a situation where the adjective means a different thing in one construction than it does in another. Uh, the payment is due. That is perfectly conventional English. The due payment, yes, you can say that, and it means the same thing, but people use that a lot less often. Okay. So sometimes you have situations in which one variant is just a lot more common, a lot more normal, if you like, and the other variant is somehow dispreferred. People don't do it all that much. These are the kinds of things that a distinctive colleague analysis can bring out. I hope uh, to have convinced you that it's actually worth the effort. Okay, so wrestling with Excel, uh, it becomes less painful once you've done it a couple of times. And each individual step isn't all that terrible. It's just that when you need to learn uh, 20 of these steps in a row, then it can be kind of a drag, and I completely understand that. Um, so if you made it through here, 
congratulations, great work. Um, so <clears throat> we've inspected all the elements, well not all the elements, but the top elements qualitatively, and it's clear that a lot more could be said about attributive and predicative adjectives, but I'll leave that for another video and uh, sign off here. So have a good week and I'll see you all in another video, probably not about color structural analysis, but about some other corpus linguistic topic. All right, that's it. Peace out.